Ridgewood Church is a place where a perfect God meets imperfect people. That means no matter where you're at in life, everyone is welcome here. This is a place where we experience God every time we gather together. A place where we discover community at every stage of life, from kids to adults from all walks of life and in every step of the journey. This is a place where we unpack and engage our God-given purpose. A place where generosity reigns as we live to serve and give back to our generous God, our community, and our world. Because ultimately, we believe that we owe everything to the God who made us and saved us, which is what we're here to do today. So we invite you to join us as we reflect on who God is and respond to all He's done for us, today at Bridgewood. Bridgewood Church, how are you? Good? Thanks so much for being here with us. Again, if you're a guest with us, and just sit back, take a deep breath. We're so glad that you're here. And I know it can be a little bit overwhelming when it's a new uh, experience for you. If you're here every week, it's good to see you. I want to also look into the camera and welcome those that are watching online this week. So again, man, you're here. Aren't you glad? Anybody else uh, excited about 2019? Okay, seven of us are. I don't know about you, but there's just an expectation that has just been consuming me for the last couple of weeks. I know we got a lot of things happening, but there's just an expectation that God is going to break out of the norm and do something that uh, is so beyond what we could, could think or imagine. And that really excites me, and I hope that's the anticipation that you have in your heart. Actually, I want you to do this. Look at two or three or four people and tell them, today's for you, okay? Tell two, three people, today is for you. We're beginning a brand new series over the next couple of weeks called Inside Out. And the reason that today is for you and for me, is that we're talking about the inside of us. And we're going to be talking over the next few weeks about relationships, but we're going to be looking at it from a little bit different twist, that, that really we're going to be looking at ourselves in every relationship that you and I have. How many of you know you and I are the common denominator in every relationship? And uh, we're going to be talking about that over the next few weeks. Um, let me just say this real quick before we jump into this, because there are a couple things that we're doing that are going to correlate with this series that I don't want you to miss out on. Our Love Shack Marriage Getaway is coming up March 15th and 16th, I believe it is. And I'll tell you what, just a super great time to break out of the winter blues and get away with a bunch of other couples, have fun, invest in your relationship do a little competition and game and all that, come back, recharge, and refueled. And we have Kurt and Tonally Collison that are just a dynamic couple. They're going to be with us for that, so I don't want you to mess. I promise you that it's going to fill up quick. They've only given us a certain block of rooms, and uh, we have to pay for those up front. So we need you to make a commitment and register. Go on our Bridgewood app. You can do that, uh, not right now, but do it later, all right, uh, so you don't miss out on it. And then next week, you don't want to miss, because I've invited back John Opaleski to be with us. He was here in the fall. We had an amazing, amazing weekend. He's kind of a life coach. He really helps coach not only pastors primarily, but business leaders and others in the whole emotional arena of our lives, the mental issue, the emotional arena. Just an unbelievable guy, really out of his own story. He really shares how, how God really saved his life and has really gotten him healthy. And so he's going to be talking about an epidemic that's in America right now called loneliness. And you would think that in a world where we're more connected than ever, have more activity and more people on the planet than ever before, that people would be highly connected. But the, the, I mean, it's just like the statistics are through the roof of how many people are around people and full of activity, but really lonely on the inside. And he's going to talk all about it and how it affects everything. So here's what I want you to do. Find someone to bring with you, okay? Because I think we all know somebody that might be struggling in, in that area or might just feel like it's hopeless. And we're just seeing when people become hopeless, they, 
they come to the end of their life and they just think there's no reason for living, but we know there is. And, and so I would text somebody, call somebody, email somebody at work, tell them, man, would you come and be with me? It's going to be great, okay? Both services, 9 and 1045 next week, so don't miss that uh, if you would. And here's what we're going to be really drilling in on, okay, is, is really about keeping this real and getting relationships right, all right? I'm, I'm the kind of person that believes that you got to keep things real, and you've, you've got to talk about real issues. I can get up here and talk about a lot of things. I'm not here to talk about myself or necessarily my own experience or my own thoughts or beliefs and things. We primarily use the Scripture in order to do it, and God has a lot to say about it. But I'm talking about real relationships here, and the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm not talking about um, text-to-text relationships or Instagram to Instagram, or Facebook to Facebook. I, I, I listened to three webinars in preparation for this series to really understand how technology is changing relationships today. And I know this, today's not about that, and so don't panic. The ushers aren't going to pass the bu- buckets at the end, and I'm not going to ask you to put your cell phone in it or anything like that, or smartphone or whatever tablet you have with you today, but I will tell you this, they are proven now that technology is rewiring the human brain. And when it's rewiring the human brain, obviously it affects relationships. So I heard um, just the average day now for the average person, they go to their phone 150 times. Okay, so that means when they go to their phone and then they stay on their phone for 10 minutes, that's only included as one touch. They're touching their phones 150 times a day, which equivalates to once every six minutes, which is four hours a day, which is 25% of your life. You're on your, and how many of you know it's not making us any smarter? Okay, we don't drive any better. We don't talk any better, communicate any better at all. So the smartphone idea, but, but it's just caused so many things that you and I have never, ever dealt with, especially in the area of relationships. Do you realize the internet right now, one-third of the internet is porn? 36%. And so we're dealing with an epidemic today that is dramatically affecting relationships and the ability to have an attention span that will really focus on a relationship that's actually face-to-face, where you actually talk face-to-face and actually do something, not, you know, what we deal with in the technology world. They, there's all kinds of, of, of sicknesses and issues people are dealing with now, like PSA. Um, phone, l- l- let me get it right. P- P- PSA, phone separation anxiety. Like, you, you know, you come running in and you're all stressed out and you're worried. And someone's like, what, 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 what's the matter? Are the kid's all right? Is everybody, is everybody okay? No, 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 worse than that, I lost my phone. You know what I'm saying? Like people just can't, they get ang- like people are going through anxiety if, if, if their phone's not, not close to them. And, and uh, phantom vibration sensation. Have you ever felt like something vibrated, you thought it was your phone and it wasn't your phone? And you kept going to it? That, that's happened. So it's like literally rewiring the brain. The reason I say all this it's not, is, is that we're dealing today, in order to keep relationships and get them right, we got to be really real with what we're dealing with. And we got to be real with things that we are dealing with today that we've never ever dealt with before if we're going to have an honest conversation about how we can get relationships right. And what this series is going to focus in on is is really helping us to understand and manage our relationships. You know, the Bible tells us that we're to manage three relationships, okay? Only three, three relationships. You might want to jot these down. Number one, our relationship to God. Number two, our relationship to others. And number three, the relationship to ourselves. That's what we're managing every single day. Like, you can't forget one of them or overlook one of them. You you have to manage those all the time in order to be effective, and to get relationships right. And so the big idea of this series, if you want kind of the big idea, what's this going to be about over the next few weeks? Here's what it's going to be about. If you want to get relationships right, you have to be right. If you want to get relationships right, you have to be right. So you got to be right on the inside 
in order for it to come out and to really just affect every area of the relationships that we're managing on a day-to-day basis. And so you and I are the common denominator. You can't get away from yourself. And so you're in every one of those relationships. And um, over the next few weeks, what we're going to really focus in on is not trying to change all of our relationships, but trying to change us and to transform us and to really be able to just throw open our arms to God and say, God, help me to focus on me. Because today's about me. Today's about what's going on on the inside. Because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. It's like a mirror. Like you can look at your heart. It's like a mirror of your life or vice versa. It, It reflects who you are at the core of your being. The Psalmist, or actually the Solomon, uh, writes to us in Proverbs 23. He says, as you think in your heart, like your mind and your heart, as you think in your heart, so are you. Like it's a, it, it helps you to self-identify who you really are when you look at your heart. So we're going to be talking a lot about the heart. And when the Bible speaks about the heart, it's talking about the entire inside of us. Like the core of your being. Like everything that's inside you and I is how the Bible refers to uh, the heart. We know that we have a physical part to us and we have an emotional part and and we have a relational part and all those things. But the heart is kind of just think of of your heart as you, as, as the core inside of you. And then also think about this. Think of your heart like a filter. Everything in life flows through your heart comes out of your heart, through your heart and out of your heart. So think of your heart like a filter. So if something is wrong on the outside, if something's happening on on the outside, it has already come through the heart. It's been filtered through. Has anybody had the awful job of cleaning out their sink trap before? You know, the filter that's in there, or ever clean out a filter before, and you, you realize that all the stuff that flows through that it gets attached to it, and it's just nasty. And, and so you can wash dishes, and you can do all things, and it can look really clean, but look at the filter. And then you'll know what, what's in that filter. You'll know, man, that, that's, what was, that's what passed through here. And, and so think of your heart in that way. And so we're going to focus on that for a little bit today. I want to talk to you today, more specifically even, about healing a broken heart. Healing a broken heart. Because think about it, if your heart is broke, it's going to impact every relationship in your life. Again, life flows out of your heart. If your heart is broke, if it's hurt, or if it's injured in some way, that's going to come out in every relationship. Your relationship to God, your relationship to others, your relationship to yourself. So last week, didn't Pastor Dells do an amazing job helping us to step onto the field of life for Super Sunday and And I thought he did an amazing job helping us to understand that when we step on the field of life, that, that, you know, we have all this stuff going on and walked us through that. Now, I thought he was dynamic, but I thought the Super Bowl was a dud. Anybody else with me? I don't know, other than my guy won. So, I was thinking about it, but if you watched the game at all, there wasn't a whole lot to watch, but if you paid attention, there were players on the sideline that were hurt or injured that couldn't play in that game. You talk about a bummer, like you finally make it to the Super Bowl and then it's that part of the season where you're hurt or injured and you can't even step on the field to play. Then there were some players that were actually hurt or injured but just said, I'm going to suck it up and I'm going to play anyway. And they went out on the field and played. Then there were others that actually were healthy and fine and then they got hurt during the game or injured in some way. And, and here's the point. In the same way that Injury is normal for football. Injury is normal for life. It happens. It happens all the time. It happens in relationships. Like the only way to not get hurt is to not play or to not live. But if you're going to live and you're going to play, you're going to do relationships, your heart's going to get broken. Your heart's going to get injured. Your heart's going to hurt. And those things then if they're not dealt with in our lives, like if we don't go to the inside of us and deal with it, all of that stuff is coming out 
And it affects every area of, of our relationship. Think of, again, what the Bible says. The Bible says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and He saves those who are crushed in spirit. So the Lord is close to those that are brokenhearted and He, and he saves those who feel crushed. Like life has crushed you. A relationship, a person has crushed you in your life and you're just kind of like pieces. You're just kind of like a blob there trying to pick up the pieces and move on in life. Where the psalmist says this, that He heals the brokenhearted and He binds up. Like He can do something with the wounds that have come from your hurt or your injury. And so I know we have a very limited, narrow view of brokenheartedness. Like when I say brokenhearted, I'm not talking about you got dumped in junior high. Okay, I'm not talking about you're brokenhearted because your team didn't win the Super Bowl or you know what, you didn't get you know, what you wanted for lunch this afternoon or whatever the case. I'm not talking about that. The, the, the word brokenhearted, the idea, the concept of broken hearts throughout Scripture is very wide and vast. It's, it, it has a lot of stuff. People, there are people that are, are broken physically. There are all through the Bible people that are, are broken uh, physically in their body. They're sick. They're diseased. There are people that are broken spiritually. Like they just uh, are on this cycle of, of, of sickness that, that keeps them from, they get close to God, then they go away from God. And they get close to God and they go away from God. There's people that are emotionally hurt and broken um, that are devastated in their minds they think things that they just can't even control or get a hold of there there are people that are are broken relationally like relationships that are separated and broken and and so people are broken in scripture in all different kinds of ways so when it says the lord is close to the brokenhearted he's he's having a very wide view of what that looks like and if we're really honest, and I hope we can be honest during these few weeks or we're really not going to get anywhere, I don't think there's a person that is here right now that is not hurt, broken, or injured in some way. I, I was praying through um, our 21 days of prayer and fasting and a thought just kept coming over and I just haven't been able to escape it. I shared it with my wife and I just said, "Hun, there's something here. We just want to develop this a little bit further. And it's... I want to be able to live life and I want to be able to minister to life out of my scars and not my wounds. Think about that. There's a difference between your scars and your wounds. Scars have been healed. Like turn to someone right now, no, don't do that, and show them your scars, all right? Like we all have scars, right? And, and those scars have a story. Th those scars could tell you something maybe stupid you did, or maybe something that you didn't even cause yourself. It just happened to you, but it's been healed over now. And they can be powerful reminders to us, but they could have powerful stories attached to them. But a wound is something that is open. And when you have an open wound, like it affects every, everything in your life. Like Just get one paper cut on your finger and then try to use your hand just for normal activities. It will bother you. It will drive you crazy. It will mess you up. I mean, the stupidest things that you're hurt or injured with have a devastating effect. Now think again, if you're hurt or injured, that's, that's being filtered through every relationship that you have in life. And so that's why we're talking about and why the good news and what you're going to hear over these next couple of weeks is, is brokenness and injury is unavoidable, but staying broken or injured is optional. So you can choose to allow that hurt or injury, the, the, a heart that's broken and, and been messed up, you can choose to stay that way or you can make a choice that I'm going to get in the inside and I'm going to fix this heart and I'm going to get this heart right because out of this heart then will flow life and it will flow into the relationships that I want. So when we're trying to fix something and we don't give God the problem, it'd be like going to the doctor if you had cancer and telling the doctor you can only work on my hand. Like, wouldn't that be stupid? Well, the problem might not be in your hand. So we offer different parts to God and we say, God, here's the part I'll offer you, but all the other areas you can't touch. If you really want to be transformed and healed, you've got to surrender your entire life. You've got to surrender all of your heart to say, God, you have the freedom to get in my heart 
And yeah, it's ugly and it's messed up and it's injured and it's hurt and there's not one of us here that isn't dealing with that. But God, would you restore it? Would you change it? Would you transform it? Would you make it right so that everything that comes through that heart is filtered into the people that I love and the relationships that I'm investing in in a right way? And so that's what we're going to talk about and we're going to look at that. And this is part of Jesus' mission coming to earth. Did you realize that? Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, Jesus said, I'm coming to earth to heal the brokenhearted. I'm coming. This was his personal mission statement in Luke chapter 4. He said, I'm coming. And, and I want you to know, he's not coming to bring shame. He's not coming to bring guilt or condemnation. He's coming to heal the brokenhearted. And, and this series is going to be helping to heal the inside of us so we can get the outside of us right. And so how do we, how do we come to the place where we can receive that in our life Here's, here's what you've got to keep saying over to yourself. I want you to keep saying this. God can heal every place that you hurt. Come on, say it with me. God can heal every place that you hurt. That's the good news today. That's why He came to bring hope and healing and health to us. He's saying, listen, I can heal every place that you hurt today. But it's optional whether you're going to come and present yourself or you're just going to continue to live the way that you are. So let's talk about, for a little bit, about how we can set ourselves up for God to heal our hearts. How many of you want to set yourself up so that you can be in the right position, the right place for God to do what He wants to do? And this is really setting us up for the next couple of weeks so you can do with it what you want. But if you want to get something out of this, you've got to set yourself up the right way. All right, so let me just give you three, let me give you three ways that you and I can set ourselves up for God to heal the inside of us. Number one is you have to own your heart. You have to own your heart. One of the values that we talked about here at Bridgewood that we said we want this to be part of our culture at Bridgewood. You remember what one of them was? It was own it. We said this is what we want to be, the kind of people that we want to be because we live in a world that wants to shift blame and responsibility to everyone else. We live in a world that nobody wants to own them. Nobody wants to own the inside. It's always someone else. It's always something else. If this and if that. And, and rather than owning it, notice what the Bible says. I could have gave you scriptures that we could have been here all day long. But, but here's one of them in Psalms. Search me. Not search my partner. Not search them because they did me wrong. Search me and know my heart and my anxious thoughts. There's something about setting yourself up by saying, I've got to own this. And I know nobody wants to own anything because in our mind, owning means that you're taking the responsibility. And a lot of times we, we struggle with that because you're like, I'm not responsible. And so if I take it and I own it myself, the other person's going to think that they won. Well, listen, if you want to play a game of winning or losing, that may work. If you want to change the inside, you got to own it. you got to come to the place where you say, God, search my heart. I want to take you to a story. I I wish I could unpack this. Actually, I think I might unpack this into a whole other series because it's super powerful. But but I want you to see this. The Gospel of John, John chapter 5. Turn turn there in your Bibles if you would. You'll want to come back to this this week if you have it. John chapter 5, Jesus is is with a bunch of broken, hurt, and injured people. It says in Scripture that he's in a town. Jesus went to Jerusalem, one of the festivals, verse number 1, and there were in Jerusalem next to the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethsaida which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. And here, watch this, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. This is a group of people that were hurt and that were injured and that were broken. Not only were they broken and injured physically, but many of them were broken emotionally and broken spiritually because they were outcasted. People walked by them. People, they they were just there and, and nobody acted like they were around except Jesus. And so when Jesus sees hurt and broken, because his mission 
was to come and heal broken people. Jesus stops, and he notices there's a guy laying there who's been an invalid, watch this, for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now you might stop there and ask, why would Jesus ask a guy that's been invalid for 38 years, does he want to get well? Because the issue is, there are patterns in our pain. Write that down. There are patterns in our pain. We're, we're people of conditions and patterns. We like patterns and we like conditions. You, you may not be aware of this, but you will when I start explaining it to you. There are patterns of pain that we all go through. And this guy was in a pattern for 38 years because Jesus says, do you want to get well? And his first response is, Jesus, every time I try to get up and get myself into the pool where he could find healing or relief, somebody else cuts in front of him. So he's in this, in this pattern of making excuses and shifting blame for 38 years. For 38 years, it's someone else's problem. It's somebody else. It's because I'm, I'm, I've been devastated in my life. I've been, I've been injured. I've been hurt. And so nobody cares about me and all that. So he's in this repetitive pattern. Start reading Scripture and looking at people and notice the patterns of their life. The woman at the well in John 4, she was in a pattern, wasn't she? She's on her fifth husband going on her sixth when Jesus has an encounter with her. So she's going from one bad relationship to the next bad relationship to the next bad relationship so whenever jesus confronts us he's always going to challenge the patterns of pain in our life he's always going to be a disruptor of the pattern because if he can change the pattern he can change the pain so so here's what he does he tells the guy listen do you want to get well because not everybody wants to get well there's a lot of people that are just going to stay doing life in their pattern you say, what kind of patterns are there? I wrote some of them down. Patterns that we get caught in all the time. Patterns of shifting blame. Patterns of making excuses. Patterns of destructive choices. Patterns of mood swings. Patterns of running away. Some patterns of going silent or getting really explosive. Patterns of being thin-skinned. I mean, I can go on and on and on of patterns that all of us, if we're honest and real, say, listen, that's a pattern that's in the pain in my life. It comes out of the hurt, the injury, the brokenness in my life. And I'm caught in it. And so we are going to always default to that pattern. But when Jesus comes, he immediately goes right to the pattern. And here's what he says. If you want to break that pattern, you've got to do something that you have never done before. That's the only way you're going to get out of a pattern. And so what does he tell the guy? He says, get up. For 38 years, he never did that. Jesus said, get up. And when he got up, the Scripture says he was healed. Now, I don't know if he was healed instantaneously. The Scripture doesn't say. There's, there's proof in the Scriptures that some people, it was a process of healing. I don't know if he got up and his knees were, and his legs were really weak and he, he could kind of, someone had to help him home or whatever, but, but he, he eventually got his strength and his healing and he broke out of the pattern of life. So here's what God's going to do for us. He, he's going to help us to go to the inside of our lives and he's going to go, you've got patterns of pain that you keep going through, that you're stuck in, and here's the question, do you want to get well? And then he says, what are you going to do differently to step outside of that pattern? And church, um, there are a lot of things that God will direct you to do. And there are a lot of things here at the church that we can help you to do. It's not exhaustive, but we've got growth classes and and we've got classes that are designed like Roots and other ones that will help you to get free from stuff or Starting Point to help you to develop a loving relationship with God. We, we've got things, that life groups that will help you have face-to-face -face relationships and not Instagram relationships so that you have accountability and you've got other people there that can help you and challenge you. Those are some things that you and I can do in our relationship. But he says, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to break out of that pattern? Are you just going to keep shifting and making excuses and passing it off and going through your mood swings and all of your anger issues and all of that kind of stuff? Listen, if that doesn't speak to all of us here, I don't know what will. 
And so you got to own it. Number two, you got to guard your heart. So here's what the wisdom of Solomon is. He says, listen, above all else, meaning top priority, like you can't miss this. Guard your heart for everything you do flows out of it. Once again, there's the filter. So he says everything in life flows out of it, so you got to guard it. And, and I know sometimes if, if you just read a text and just use just our, your common sense, the text immediately implies that there's an opposition against your heart, doesn't it? It's not telling you to guard your heart if there wasn't an attack against it. Or, so, so realize this, the enemy of our lives knows that if he gets your heart jacked up, he gets your life jacked up. So if your heart's jacked up, your relationships are jacked up. So don't think for one minute he's not a strategist that understands that. So that's why the wisdom of Scripture says, guard your heart because if you get hurt, you get wounded, you get injured, and if you're doing life, it's going to happen. And if you don't guard it, here's what's going to happen. That's going to come out in every relationship in your life. Here's the deal. Sin always starts in our heart before it comes out in our behavior. Sin always starts in the heart before it comes out in our behavior. So like David who wrote this, if you know David's story, he wasn't perfect. David, David committed big sin. But you know how that sin happened? Because there was something in his heart he didn't deal with. Lust was in his heart before adultery. And anger and cover-up was in his heart before murder. So if you would guard your heart, guarding your heart means this. Church, listen to me. Guarding your heart doesn't mean I'm not going to be in any relationships anymore so I can guard my heart. Guarding your heart isn't I'm not going to trust anybody anymore because they could break my heart. Okay, welcome to life. It's going to happen. That's not what guarding our hearts mean. Guarding our heart means dealing with the sin in our heart before it comes out in our life. That's what guarding our heart means. Here's what David said. Here's how how David said, I guard my heart. I fill my heart with Scripture. He said, Lord, I've hid your word in my what? In my heart so that I might not sin against you. So that if that life has to come through the filter of your heart, it's first going to hit Scripture. And then Scripture is going to tell you, here's how you need to process this. Here's the truth of what's going on here. You need to forgive, or you need the love, or you, you need to, and, and so that will come through the filter of Scripture. If there's no Scripture there, listen, if you're relying on Oprah or some self-help book or the Google or whatever, or your friend, all right, there's no wisdom there to help you get through what you and I have to navigate today through our relationships. But Scripture deals with everything. It deals with every one of those issues that are in our heart. Bitterness and jealousy and envy and anger and lust and all of that stuff. So David knows, man, if I would have guarded my heart, meaning I would have had a daily confession of sin, I would have had a daily transformation and surrender of my heart back to God, I could have kept from doing what I did and destroying my relationship. That's what guarding our heart means. Not walking out and saying, oh, I'm just not going to do relationship anymore. If you do that, you're going to miss out on one of the greatest elements of life, which is relationship. So guard it. Psalm says many sins come out of the hard and stubborn hearts. There's no limit to the evil things that they can think up. Like your heart is an, has an endless capacity of evil. Like we see that every day in the news, don't we? Like when you think you've seen it all, it goes another level. So if you and I don't bring our heart to God, and, and I know because I can tell, I can hear hearts beating right now. Some of you immediately kind of crossed your, your hands because you're like, okay, this is where he starts thumping us with the Bible. And the Bible's so outdated. And the Bible just tells us we can't do anything. And the Bible just kills all the fun in my life. <laughs> Like, I can read your minds right now. So think about this, okay? If you go to Home Depot today, 
and you buy a chainsaw, and you bring that chainsaw home and you open the box, there's rules all over it. Don't climb a tree with this chainsaw. Don't hang this chainsaw off a ladder while you're standing on it. Don't use the chainsaw to cut the turkey. It will have all kinds of things. Then you'll get a manual that will be this thick that will tell you don't use a chainsaw you know, to trim carpet in your house or to do this, and we'll have a line through it. You know, uh, we get that all the time, don't we? You'll get, don't put your head, your kid's head in the crock pot. Don't throw your computer in the water, and then you'll see it, and they'll have a big X and a line through it. Here's the deal, right? Listen to me. I'm just being real. You don't get hacked off at Home Depot, do you? You don't start going, oh, Home Depot just doesn't want me to have fun with my chainsaw. Trying to tell me what to do. No, intuitively, you and I know Home Depot's just trying to help you from cutting your stinking arm off. That's what they're doing. And so we hear that and we we see that. And here's the deal. We give more grace to Home Depot than we do to God. When God's saying, listen, the reason I said don't have sex before marriage is because I designed it and created it. I know how it works. And I'm trying to save you from a lot of hurt and a lot of pain that will last your entire lifetime. Here's why God says in relationships to forgive and not to hold on to things. Because forgiveness isn't for the other person. The forgiveness is for us. People will go on with life after they have messed you over and they won't think two seconds about it and you'll be miserable the rest of your life. So the Bible's smart. It, God, God's way smarter than us, so he, he got this all figured out. So that's what he tells us. Guard your heart. Thirdly, here's how we're going to set ourselves up. Ready? We're going to align ourselves to God's heart. you got to align your heart to God's heart. So they came to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, boil this whole thing down. What do I need to do? There were 613 laws in the Old Testament. Nobody could keep them. They said, okay, you know, Tell us 10 of them so we can try to keep them. Oh, they couldn't keep 10. Well, just boil it down. Tell us the one thing. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Other translations say with all your strength. It's the first and greatest command. Then he said, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So here's what he was trying to help them to understand. There is a vertical and horizontal flow going on here that God totally understands. What he's saying is the capacity to love first begins with loving God in our vertical relationship. And so when you get loving God right, when you get your heart right with God, then you immediately begin to see the horizontal change, the way that you love others. And the Scripture doesn't say love others, love others, um, if you love yourself or the way that you love yourself, the Scripture already implies that you and I love ourselves. There's nobody here that doesn't love themselves. So the Scripture already assumes that. It says you're to love your neighbor like you love yourself. And so you kind of hear that and you're like, that's impossible. Do you realize that all of the commands in the Old Testament were to help people to realize they can't do it in and of themselves? that they needed a Savior, they would all point to Jesus. Like, there's no way. Do you understand you don't have the capacity to love God unless God comes to you? Like, you can't come into a relationship with God unless the Holy Spirit first draws you because you don't have the capacity. I don't have the capacity. You and I don't have the capacity to love our neighbor as ourself unless God has given you the capacity. I love what John Piper says about this verse. He says, He says, when you really understand this, our love for God, he says, loving God is like loving the invisible, isn't it? It's like an inner passion of our soul. It's like hard for sometimes for people to understand that because God, you know, isn't physical right in front of us that we can love and do stuff with. But he says, he says, the greatest demonstration of our love for God is when we love others. Does that make sense? So so it's like God is saying, listen, I want your love, but do you realize that when you love others, it's a reflection of your love for me? Meaning, 
the way that you receive the love of God is going to filter through your heart to the way that you love others. Like when you start thinking about the love of God, how wide and how deep and how wide it is that he forgave you when you messed him over, when you rejected him, when you've broken your promises and betrayed him, and over and over again, he continues to be gracious and kind. He begins to extend love to you. He doesn't kick you out of the kingdom and say, no, 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 you made a mistake. You'll never, ever come in. You don't get another chance. It's unconditional. When you begin to fill your heart with that, it, it, it can't stay in you without affecting the horizontal relationship. 1 John says it's not that we loved God, but that He first loved us. That's really the truth. And so what we're going to do is just set ourselves up by saying, God, I've got to get this relationship where it needs to be in order to get these relationships right. And the more that I'm willing to do that from the inside, it's going to flow naturally. And I'm going to fill this heart with the right things. I'm going to fill it with your love. And so I'm going to expand my capacity to love others and to do things I could never do in myself because I can't do it. But he can help us to do it. Would you stand with me? The band's going to come. And as they come, here's what I want you to do. Would you just um, close your eyes for just a moment? Let's just, let's just get real. Let's just get honest. Don't, don't freak out. We're not going to do anything weird. Or I just want you to just try to put away the distraction of everyone else or anybody else around you. This is about inside us now. This is about inside my heart, your heart. I'm trying to set us up so that God can do His best work. His best work is when you and I surrender to Him and let Him do it rather than us trying to do it. So we talked about three things. Number one, we talked about owning your heart. So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about one or two patterns of pain that you feel stuck in right now. What is your pattern of pain that you feel stuck in that you keep doing over and over and over again? Because Jesus is here and he's going to confront that pattern and he's going to say, do you want to get well? Just like he did a guy, and it don't matter whether you've been there for 38 years or 38 minutes, he's going to challenge the pattern because if he doesn't challenge the pattern, then that means he'd have to leave you in your pain. And he doesn't want to do that. He wants to heal you. The other thing we talked about was guarding. A daily confession, a, a, an honest laying out of your heart before God and saying, God, I even recognize right now that there's some things that aren't right in this heart that I know are coming out, like lust and anger and all those things. And so... I, man, I can try to fool myself, but it, it's, it's coming out. Like everything in life's filtering through that. And so maybe it's a confession to God and saying, God, I'm, here's some things that are in my heart that I'm, I'm well aware of. I'm just being honest with you. I'm laying those things to you. God, would you, would you take those? Remember, he's not here for shame and condemnation. He's here for hope and healing and health today. So you can bring that to him. The other thing is to align your heart. Maybe, maybe the reason is that you don't have the capacity to love because you don't have the capacity, you're not, you're not loving God to your fullest capacity. Or maybe you've never, maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God. That's the first place to start. And it's amazing what he'll do and the capacity that he'll give you. And so maybe it's aligning your heart. So they're going to sing this through. And, and while they're singing it, even more than singing, I want you to, to find yourself in one of those three responses or in all of those responses. And we're going to give you an opportunity to, to bring that to God and to do something with it, all right? So as they sing, I want, you to, I want you to find yourself in one of those three places. Here we go. And I can't think of a better way to wrap up that service and respond to that word than to sing those words and to proclaim that to the Lord, to proclaim that we need him to change us from the inside out. Now, I don't know about you, but it's really tempting for me to 
walk away from, from something like this and to, to want to change my relationships, but to just go out and, and try to fix everything without looking inside of myself and looking at how I contribute to it and making sure that my heart and everything within me is ready to go as proper as the way that God wants it to be. So we got to respond to that today, church. Aren't you glad for pastors that will preach the word even when it's hard to hear, even when it digs deep within us a little bit and is challenging for us? I don't want to just walk out these doors just feeling better if it doesn't transform my life. So, so what's your next step? What's your takeaway from that? Each and every one of us need to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. And in fact, I, I want to do something. There was a gentleman that came to me just before coming up and, and was just discerning what the Spirit was saying and, and felt like God wants us to pray over the, the bondage and over the roots of, of self-hatred. You know, God said to us, that Jesus said that those two things are the most important. First and foremost, to love God with all of our heart, and secondly, to love our neighbor as ourselves. But we can't love other people, we can't love God if we don't love ourselves first, right? How can we love our neighbor as ourselves if that is broken, if that is, if we hate ourselves? We, we can't do that, and there might be people in this place today, I and mean, that's what you're getting hung up on. And whatever it is, I want to encourage you to bring that to the Lord, to, to surrender that to him. So let's pray together. Let's give him our lives. Heavenly Father, God, we surrender to you now, Lord. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives, God. We want to pray with the heart of David that says, search my heart, that it would be a pure heart, that it would be the heart that you want to give me, Lord, that it's not stuck in bondage and in roots of, of bitterness, of, of lust, of sin, of hatred for myself. God, if there's a, somebody in this room today that is struggling with hating themselves in the name of Jesus, God, we proclaim that that is not what you have for that person. God, that we ask that your love would infiltrate their lives, would set them free in the name of Jesus. God, that we we pray against the oppression of Satan to try to make them feel that way, to try to bring that burden and that heaviness on their lives. God, may we experience your love so that we can love each and every person around this place, each and every person in the world the way that you loved us, that that would flow through us to the world around us. So God, we pray that in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. God, whatever it is that each and every person needs to do in this place, to, to clean out their hearts, to be right with you and to be right with others. So God, that we could have the thriving relationships that you want us to have. So God, change us from the inside out. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, aren't you grateful for God's love in this place? Listen, as, as you wrap everything up today. There's a lot of different ways that you can respond. Our prayer team is going to be up here at the altar. If you need to come forward and you need prayer for anything, you want somebody to pray over you, please come. They're going to be here. If you want to be baptized today, that's ready to go out there. If you want to proclaim that new life, listen, some people might have made a decision today to come to Christ for the very first time and to begin that relationship and get your heart right with the Lord. If that's you on the way out, we have kits at the door at both exits that you can grab. It's got a Bible in there. We want to walk alongside of you in that. If you made the decision, we want to celebrate with you. And then that will help you to know what some of the next steps that you can take are. Make sure to tell somebody. Maybe you can tell one of the pastors or you can tell a friend that you came with that you're making that decision today. We want to celebrate that along with you and, and just glorify God over that, but whatever it might be, maybe it's signing up for a class, maybe it's signing up for Roots and really dealing with those issues that are deep within you or, or starting point or whatever that might be. Let's take our steps as we leave this place today. And just a couple of things that I want to share with you. We're excited for next week is going to be our all church team night. That's going to be happening after service from four to six o'clock at our Bridgewood Good Rich location, Bridgewood North. It's going to be happening over there. A lot of you guys haven't seen it yet and haven't been able to uh, 
uh, go in that building. So we're going to do it there so that you can see it and, and walk around the building and we can share the vision of what God's doing. But listen, here's the deal is that this year, 2019, God has given us an incredible resource and the ability to expand the influence of this church to a new community, to more people. And we need everybody to be a part of Team Bridgewood to make that happen. And that's what that night is all about, is us sharing you with you what we're going to be doing and all that it's going to take. So we need you on board. So join us that night from 4 to 6 o'clock. You can see the building and hear about what God has in store for us moving forward. And also, the Weavers, these people over here, are having twins, if you didn't know that, right? And we're going to do a shower for them right after that team night and shower them with love and with gifts because they're going to need all the help that they can get. Amen. Amen. It's going to be good. So, hey, have an amazing day. As you leave this place, remember to sign up for the Love Shack Marriage Retreat. That's going to be great. And then join us back here for, uh, for part two of Inside Out. And listen, last thing before you go, as you're exiting, we have the opportunity to give of our tithes and offerings. There's no better way to respond to what God has done by surrendering everything to him and surrendering even our finances to him. So let's worship him with our giving. If you need to come forward, do that. But the ushers are going to be standing at the door. You can give as you go. Have a great day. Be blessed. God bless you. We'll see you next week.